to apologize in advance. I'm going to talk fast because I have negative one minutes for this talk. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Just to give you an idea, I, my goal was to identify practice changing articles and trending articles you should know about. This is not an um, all-inclusive discussion. A couple of things I specifically didn't talk about are opioid crisis. There's a lot of stuff out there, but I didn't include that today. And I guarantee I'm going to offend some people in the audience because I'm not highlighting their papers, so I apologize in advance. Uh, some other important things, the Nelson trial is coming out, and Gail Darling did a great talk on that yesterday. I didn't have an opportunity to, to review CHEST or JTO papers or a lot of the breakthrough findings in stage four, and there are a lot of them. It's good to be familiar with them, but we didn't have time to get through all that. And thanks to Mark Ferguson and Reza Maron who helped me with this. There we go. Okay, so I used these Plum X metrics where they're available. Oh, it's not showing up there. <laughs> Anyway, these Plum X metrics are this new measure a lot of journals are using that looks at how many tweets go out, how many Facebook pages are on it, uh, media mentions, and so forth. And I think it's time for all of us to start paying attention to this. And I may even have to start my own Twitter account after thinking about this more. So when that's available, I used it. Uh, I'm going to go through the main journals that I reviewed, starting with New England Journal of Medicine. Just uh, in January, there was a paper on hybrid minimally invasive esophagectomy for esophageal cancer. It's a really interesting paper. This is a randomized trial of about 200 patients that were randomized to either an open abdomen surgery, an open chest, or a laparoscopic abdomen open chest approach. It included squamous and adenocarcinoma, and both patients with neoadjuvant therapy and those without. It was about two-thirds that had neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, and they found su substantially higher complication rate in the open-open group compared to the LAP-open group. So 64% versus 36%. And it also translated to a difference in long-term survival. So I'm sure there are things to pick apart and look at closely with this study, but this is one that's definitely worth reading about. Maybe put it on for your journal club. Okay, Pacific Trial. We've talked a lot about this at Ginsburg Day. For those of you who weren't here, this is the survival results that were published in December but were online in September, showing that in inoperable stage three lung cancer patients, and Harvey Pass gave us a good discussion of how that was defined, because it really wasn't. So theoretically, inoperable stage three lung cancer patients with chemo radiation followed by a year of Dervalumab, two-year survival of 66%. For those who just had chemo radiation, 55%. There was more of a difference in disease-free survival. But this is definitely a practice changer in the inoperable group of patients. Uh, this was also presented yesterday. For those of you who didn't see it, um, many people in the audience participated in this trial with uh, Hopkins and Memorial Sloan Kettering being the main sites using neoadjuvant PD-1 blockade with nivolumab that they were able to perform the operation safely and with good results. 45% major pathologic response. This is a big deal and can be really impactful going forward. Uh, not yet FDA approved, but we're definitely gonna see more studies and this is, I think, gonna be a big paradigm shift for us. Just show this for fun. This was the most downloaded image from the New England Journal. Some guy was on ECMO, was uh, a little bit coagulopathic and I guess had some blood in his airway and coughed out a perfect bronchial tree. Another paper that might not have hit your radar but should is this paper that just came out in November on minimally invasive versus open hysterectomy for cervical cancer. And I mention it because this is a randomized study and there's a significant three-year survival rate difference between the two groups and it's not what you think. The minimally invasive patients did worse than the open patients. And this is getting enough of attention. There were about 25 emails that floated around with our robotics committee because everyone's kind of wondering, what does this mean for all the rest of the cancer surgery that we're doing minimally invasively? How are we gonna message this to our community, to our patients? Is it impactful across the board for cancer surgery? But this is an article you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with. And this shows the survival rate differences. So for a pretty curable disease, Okay, JAMA surgery. This paper just came out two weeks ago, and I didn't otherwise review JAMA surgery, only this particular article. This is another one you were gonna wanna know about and be able to discuss the fine points. This looked at measurement of um, patients who had stereotactic, stereotactic radiation therapy and then went on to surgery. It was T1 to 2N0 by clinical staging. The surgery was performed 10 weeks later, so the idea was to give, their, give time for the radiation to have an effect. 
we have sort of presumed that SBRT has a 100% kill rate or 100% path response, and this study showed it was only 60%. So a lot of surgeons are getting very excited about this to say, see, we told you all along, surgery's better than radiation. Um, the problem is the people who really know the biology of radiation, it probably takes a year for the SBRT to take effect. So the 10-week time point is probably not really that accurate for trying to answer that question. But again, this is something you should be familiar with. The STS General Thoracic Workforce is going to be putting forth a position statement on this, and we're trying to make sure we give a balanced approach, but something you might want to read and discuss in a journal club. Annals of Surgery, our highest impact surgical journal. Uh, they have really great, good things on their website for looking at metrics of who's reading what, who's emailing what, who's downloading, and on each individual article you can actually track all kinds of metrics. These were the top viewed articles for the year, and so I'm going to highlight one of them and then tell you about another important paper from them. So this is a really pretty interesting topic, a difficult topic, workplace bullying among surgeons, the perfect crime. And I would posit that many of us have either been victims of bullying or been the perpetrators of bullying or maybe a little bit of both, but it's something we need to be thinking about. It has a big impact on burnout and other factors that people are talking about. And they present some interesting scenarios of either residents being heckled during conferences and getting them flustered and then continuing to heckle them, or junior faculty who are sort of dismissed and their, their input is not valued uh, and they're not put forth for promotion and things like that. So this is something we all need to be paying attention to. Two institutions, University of Washington and University of New Mexico, have already added language to their professionalism codes of conduct about this. So the conclusion is that this is a new problem. We need to learn more about it and get better at trying to combat this problem. Another important paper came from a PCORI grant. Uh, as Courtney talked about earlier, Benj Kozauer earned a PCORI grant and looked at lung cancer surveillance. Um, this was published in Annals of Surgery in the fall, I think it was October. 4,400 patients, they looked at all different follow-up schema and found that essentially whether they, patients are seen at three, six, or 12 months, the outcomes are basically the same. The conclusion was that a six or 12 month interval is acceptable and CCN guidelines typically are saying six months, but they have upped it to more frequent intervals for more advanced stages. This is a tough, tough problem to study, but this is the best data that we have. Okay, Journal of American College of Surgeons. They also have these most viewed pages as well as the Plum X metrics, and you can't really read it, I realize, but I'll just let you know that of the, the top Plum X metrics papers for the year, five of them have to do with what we wear in the operating room, believe it or not. And last year we talked about the hats. <laughs> um, this year, a pretty interesting paper, they looked at the AORN guidelines, and at NYU they looked at what they did before AORN went into practice with these guidelines and what happened afterwards. And the, the high points are that at their institution it cost about 10 cents per person to walk in the operating room with a hat and mask or whatever. After the policy change it cost $1.25. And then they have to wear these long sleeve jacket things that at their hospital, that was $1.1 million in expense in one year. And if you translate that to all the hospitals in the US, that's $540 million. Guess what? It didn't change the surgical site infection rate. It's all the same. So all that money spent for nothing. So this is just more of a call for evidence-based practice. Okay, Journal of Clinical Oncology. Lots of big, important papers on stage four management, and you have to keep up with that stuff to know what's going to happen next in the, neo, in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. I'm not going to go through all that, but one paper I wanted to mention, really nice review. It's the second most read paper for the year from Julie Bramer and colleagues on how to manage the immune-related consequences of checkpoint inhibitors. And you might say, that's not a problem, it's medical oncology. but we're going to start operating on these patients, and we need to start looking for crazy stuff like pancreatitis and thyroiditis and pneumonitis and know how to grade the degree of complication. So it's something we need to know about. They have tables like this for every um, organ, essentially. So it's a really good reference paper. JTCVS top articles. I was only able to look at the Plum X metrics for this. Two main papers are listed there, and in fact, two of those were the top papers last year as well. Um, once again, our own Mara Antonoff's New Yorker cover challenge is still high in the list and primarily because of social media sharing, uh, pictures of female surgeons surrounding a camera in the operating room. 
and a really great paper, many of you in the audience participated in this, establishing guidelines for empyema management, absolutely worth downloading this, studying it, learning it, and following these algorithms for acute empyema versus chronic empyema. And then finally, Annals of Thoracic Surgery, uh, one of the fourth highest rated PlumEx paper for the last two years comes from several GTSC members, and it's a really great manuscript on how to be a reviewer for journals. I highly recommend that. Another interesting paper looked at neoadjuvant chemotherapy for thymic malignancies. This was a database study from Korea, over almost 1,500 patients. About 7% of them had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They compared that with matched members of the non-chemotherapy the non group, and they found no difference in mortality, length of stay, complications, but there were more transfusions in the chemo group. But path CR rates, tumor sizes, five-year survival rates, everything else was basically the same. So it calls into question the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, at least our traditional types of chemotherapy. As we mentioned at Ginsburg Day, we don't have any trials for thymic mal malignancies anywhere in the cooperative groups. This is maybe more of a call to action for us to come up with something. And my guess is it's going to be, mean better chemotherapy or maybe use of checkpoint inhibitors. Okay, another paper from NCDB looking at extending surgery in mesothelioma to these higher risk groups, biphasic and sarcomatoid. If you read through the data, I don't think it's there for sarcomatoid. They did poorly before, they still do poorly. They don't pass my rule of the five-year survival being better than the perioperative mortality, so I don't think we should operate on those. But the biphasic patients, there is some benefit to having surgical intervention based on this review, and the SWOG trial uh, is expanding to that group. I think we need to keep an open mind to that. Um, our STS scholarship winner is the first author of this paper, Jeff Yang, and this is from uh, our Duke colleagues looking at neoadjuvant ipilimumab combined with chemotherapy. They had 13 patients in that group compared to 42 in the chemo alone group. They also showed safety and feasibility of surgical resection. Just to compare to some of the numbers we heard yesterday from Rich Botafrano, they did have about a 20% conversion rate to open, and this is in Tommy D'Amico country, so I think that's significant. Um, but interestingly, the path CR rate was quite a bit lower. Uh, they didn't record major pathologic response, so we can't compare it directly to the Hopkins Sloan Kettering paper, but uh, interesting to look at this, and I think this is just as important of a paper as the other. Um, another interesting paper looks at perioperative outcomes, male versus female, from MD Anderson. They case matched pairs of patients, and they had the same number of ED visits, but if a woman goes to the ED, they're more likely to get admitted than if a man goes to the ED. Pretty interesting. And um, this looks at the different reasons they went to the ER. So each one is if they came to the ER and they were discharged or they came to the ER and they were admitted. And you can see that shortness of breath that the women almost always got admitted for that. But among all these other problems, the men complained more about pain, but they got sent home. Um, <laughs> but I think this is, this is interesting to look at. As, as we think of strategies to deal with readmissions, we actually should really be paying attention to gender and maybe see how we can incorporate that in our discharge planning, our teaching, and so forth. Um, and then finally, two papers on digital air leak monitoring. One prospective randomized study showed no difference. Um, I'm going to skip through those. And one retrospective study showed, yes, indeed, there was a difference in chest tube duration and length of stay in 226 patients. These two articles were published in the same uh, uh, version of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, so you can read both of them from, I think it was October, but I'm not sure. So that's as fast as I could go. Other things to remember, the Lung Cancer Updates podcast is outstanding. You can get CME credit for it. I listen to it all the time. CTSNet Journal and News Scan by Mark Ferguson is another great resource. And then Mara Antonoff, Shanda Blackman, and I are working with CTSNet to convert several videos to podcasts and also some of the STS roundtables to podcasts so that you can listen while you run or while you drive or what have you. That's it. Thank you.